welcome to study number four in the series about the church that Jesus wants. What's the vision that Jesus has for his church? Today we're looking at study number four, which is God's eternal purpose. Why are we here? Are we here by accident? Are we meaningless blobs? Why did God create the heavens and the earth? Why did he create man? Does he have a purpose and a plan? That's what we're looking at uh, today. But just before we move into that uh, session, let's just revise a little of what we've looked at in the previous uh, sessions. We had some important questions that we wanted to, to answer. Uh, what's the vision that Jesus has for his church? We looked at that and we wanted to know what it was that was in the heart of Jesus, because that's what's really important. What sort of people does God want? What does he want us to be? How does, how does he want us to fulfill his plan, his purpose and his, his mission? That was in study number one. In the second study, which actually we did in two parts, A and B, on the two mysteries, the mystery of iniquity and the mystery of godliness. These are two mysteries that are traveling together in time and are both going to be fulfilled in the last days. And then in study number three, we looked at the pressure to change. And we saw how in the early church, there were so many pressures that they had to face. Circumstances changed dramatically. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't leave a church building manual behind. What were they to do? All of a sudden, there was a change. Jesus had said that there would be 12 apostles sitting on the 12 thrones of Israel. But now one of them was lost. What should they do? They had crisis after crisis, and in these crises that they went through, you know, they lost an apostle, they, they then had the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and people began to speak in other languages. What were they going to do? Then 3,000 got saved and baptized. What were they going to do? These pressures to change was the normal formative process that the Holy Spirit was going to use to process the church to change and transform the church to be the people of God that God was looking for on the face of the earth. This is what we've looked at in the past. Today, in looking at study number four, what is the eternal purpose? How and when will the world finish and what will it look like? In Ephesians 3, 7 to 11, Paul said, I became a minister that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God. So God had a plan and a purpose from the beginning. And then he goes on to say, and now the manifold wisdom of God may be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Jesus Christ. He also told the Colossian church in Colossians chapter 1, verses 25 to 27, I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, in this study, we will look at the eternal decisions that God made from before the foundation of the world. This is his eternal purpose. Before there was a heaven and an earth, God made decisions. Now, Let's go back to the very beginning, starting with the fact that God himself is eternal. As it says in Psalm 90 and verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, 
or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. See, God inhabits eternity. And in Isaiah 57, 15, we are told that very thing, that God inhabits eternity. God is eternal. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. When we look into a number of scriptures in the Bible, like Isaiah 9 and verse 6, it talks about the eternal Father, the everlasting Father. In Hebrews 9, 14, we have the eternal Spirit. The Holy Spirit is eternal. In John 1 and verse 1, we have the eternal Word. He was there from the beginning. In the beginning, uh, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In Revelation 22 and 13, Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the Eternal One. And God, who is eternal, has an eternal purpose. In Ephesians 3.11, Paul uh, began to expound on this subject, the eternal purpose of which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus is the central figure in this eternal purpose that God has. And the eternal plan and purpose that God has was formed in his divine parliament, the council of God. And we see this referred to in Jeremiah 23 and verse 18. There were only three members, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the Lord asks the question, who has stood in the council of the Lord to see or hear his word? You see, in that divine parliament, the divine council, God made eternal decisions. And if we want to understand his plan and purpose for today, we need to understand those decisions that he made. See, God declares the end from the beginning. So if we want to know what's going to happen at the end, we need to go back to the beginning. In Isaiah 41, 26, it says, Who told of, of this from the beginning? So we could know, or beforehand, so we could say, He was right. No one told of this. No one foretold it. No one heard any words from you. In Isaiah 46 and verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning. God, who is eternal, tells us the end from the beginning. And he has eternal plans. In 2 Kings 19 to 25, have you not heard? Long ago I ordained it. In days of old I planned it. Now I have brought it to pass. In Acts 15, 18, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. You see, nothing surprises God. And when we are in his hand and walking with him and understand his plan and purpose, nothing should surprise us as well. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9, it says, As it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. It was hidden from the world. In 1 Corinthians 2, 7 and 8, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But he has revealed it to his own people. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things, of God. We are not to be ignorant of the plan and purpose of God that he has planned from eternity. God made eternal decisions and these eternal decisions were made before time began. God planned, number, let's have a look at these. Number one, God planned the heavens and the earth. The heavens and the earth were no accident. God didn't just sneeze and achoo! A heaven and an earth. No. God planned. This was God's working factory, arena, to bring to pass his eternal uh, plans. Interestingly, a famous scientist, Stephen uh, Hawking, in a lecture on the beginning of time, said, In this lecture, 
I would like to discuss whether time itself has a beginning and whether it will have an end. All the evidence seems to indicate that the universe has not existed forever, but that it had a beginning. This is probably the most remarkable discovery of modern cosmology. Now, this man was an atheist, but he acknowledges that there was a beginning, and that beginning is God. God determined time and space. Time and space are limited. They have a beginning, and they will have an end. Interestingly, all known ancient religious books describe time as being eternal. Only the Bible tells us and claims that there was a moment in time, as we know it, that time did not exist. Time has a beginning. It has an end. Eternity is God's dimension. In Acts 17, 26, and it says, uh, And God has made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Secondly, God made eternal plans for man. God planned for man to be in his image and likeness. Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. In 1 Corinthians 15, 49, we see that this is centered in Christ. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, referring to Christ. In Romans 8, 29 to 30, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, we all are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Colossians 3.10 And have put on the new man, which was renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. You see, God wants us to be just like Jesus. He planned from the very beginning that we should be changed and transformed from being in the earthy image, to being in his image, in the fullness and the likeness of Christ. Thirdly, God planned for us to be his children from eternity. Ephesians 1 and verse 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. The word adoption here means coming to the full maturity of being his children unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Fourthly, God planned for man to be accepted in Christ. There is no other way for our acceptance in the divine plan except through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1, 6, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in Christ. Fifthly, God planned for man to be redeemed and forgiven. These are amazing plans that before ever there was say, Satan or sin or death, God made these plans in eternity, in that divine parliament. In Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Sixthly, back there in eternity, God planned for man to be holy. God didn't plan for us to fall. He didn't plan for us to have sin in our lives, but God knew that it was going to happen. And so he made plans for our redemption, our salvation, um, our forgiveness, and ultimately for us to become perfect in Christ. Ephesians 1.4 according as he hath chosen us in him. We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in, in love. He wants us to be absolutely perfect, holy, sinless, and righteous. Seventhly, God planned that we would be one in Christ. Ephesians 1, 9 to 10. 
having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. He wants to gather all believers together. There's not going to be multiple churches and denominations or religions. No, the only ones that are going to be there with him in eternity are those who he has gathered together in Christ. And he wants us to be one in Jesus Christ. Eighthly, God planned for us to obtain an eternal inheritance. I'm amazed at how awesome our God is, that before Genesis 1 verse 1, way back in the beginning, God had these awesome plans ready for you and I, and he planned for us to have this eternal inheritance. In Ephesians 1.11 it says, In Christ we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined, means planned from beforehand, according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Ninthly, way back there in eternity, God planned for man to be saved and called according to his eternal purpose. The Bible has so much to say about this, and this is something we need to grasp. He has an eternal plan. 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 9, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus. When? Before time began. The tenth thing that God had decided way back there in eternity, God planned that his eternal wisdom would be made known by the church. We were going to be the instrument. We are the instrument that is going to reveal God's wisdom. Ephesians 3, 8 to 10. Paul said, unto me is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in Christ, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. How awesome is that? You know, the wisdom of this world is nothing compared to the wisdom of God, but God has chosen us to be the instrument to make that wisdom known, even to the principalities and the powers. The 11th thing that we could say that God decided back there in, in eternity is that God planned to take people from all nations so that they would become his people. See, our God is a great commission. God, he gave us the great commission to go into all the world. And he wants people out of every tribe, kindred, nation and tongue to be a part of that eternal family. And in Romans 16, 25 to 26, Paul writes, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret until uh, since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. And Ephesians 3, 3 to 6, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery which in other ages has not been made known. Other ages didn't understand this. We who live in these days, it's given to us to understand this. In other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Co-heirs with Christ. 
co-heirs, Jews and Gentiles together in one body. This is God's eternal plan, planned from before the foundation of the world. A twelfth decision that God made back there in eternity was that God planned for the church to be glorious and perfect. In fact, he, he wants his church to be the bride of Christ. In Colossians 1, 27 to 28, God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Notice three times in that verse, it says every man, every man, every man. God looks upon every person as having an equal opportunity that they might hear the gospel, that they might be changed and transformed, that they might know the mystery, that they might come to the fullness of the potential that God has put within them to be his bride. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. It is not going to be a defeated, runaway church in the end times, but a glorious, victorious, overcoming church. That's what Jesus is looking for. The 13th decision that we could uh, refer to is that God's eternal decision for Christ himself to be the slain Lamb. There had to be a way that salvation was going to come. And Christ was determined to be the Lamb of God. In 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb, without blemish, without spot, who truly was foreordained before the foundation of the world. God planned for the cross from eternity and Jesus was chosen to be our saviour, to be the Lamb of God. Before there was sin, God had already planned the remedy. In Acts 2, 23 to 24, this man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. This is, this is Peter as he's preaching on the day of Pentecost. God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep a hold on him. Hallelujah. And the 14th decision, God's eternal decision for Satan, See, God knew that Satan was going to fall and rebel, but God planned for his everlasting destruction. In 1 John 3 and verse 8, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. In Revelation 20 and verse 10, At the end, the final judgment, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever. Fifteenth decision that God made. This was the eternal decision for his kingdom. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. And in Revelation 10, 7, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And it continues in Revelation eleven fifteen. the seventh angel sounded, and there was a loud voice in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Brothers and sisters, we were made and saved for a sinless and glorious eternity, to be a part of his kingdom. That's why it says in Ecclesiastes 3.11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. 
Also, he has put eternity in their hearts. We were created for eternity. We are eternal. The heavens and the earth, this physical realm will pass away. As it tells us in Revelation chapter 21, the heavens and the earth will pass away. We'll get a new heavens, a new earth, a new Jerusalem, and we're going to be living in that kingdom forever and ever. Wow! We have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. What a wonderful eternity we have waiting for us.